Today is April 7, 2004. My name is Janet Palmer, and I'm interviewing Mr. Billy Lowry for the Veterans History Project at the Atlanta History Center. Mr. Lowry, would you please state your full name? Billy L. Lowry. And what was your date of birth, and where were you born? Uh, February 4, 1923. And where in, were you born? Uh, Atlanta, in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, what branch of service were you in during World War II? The Army Air Force. And what was the highest rank that you attained? Tech Sergeant. And what was your serial number? 34689471. And where were you primarily um, during the war? Uh, during uh, combat overseas, I was in uh, England at, uh, well, I was several places, but when we started flying, I was, based at Snetterton Heath, and that was uh, the ninety-six Bomb Group, 338 Bomb Squadron, uh, the 8th Air Force. And what could you tell me a little bit about what you were doing before you went into the service? Where you where you were living, and a little bit about your family life. Well, we lived near what is known as East Atlanta, and uh, except for the first two years. And uh, we lived in the first two years at uh, a place, a house near Cascade Springs. It used to be uh, sort of the place to go have a picnic. Were you living with your your parents? Yes. Mm -hmm. And how old were you when you went in the service? That's, uh, mm -hmm. 20, I guess. 20? 20. 19, 19, 19 20. Uh, um, did you... Uh, did you join the service, or were you drafted? I was drafted. You were drafted. How did you feel about that? Well, I did everything I could to not be drafted. So I finally had to give up. And, well, there's a couple of circumstances that delayed it a couple of months here and there. but. How did you feel when you when you got that draft? Well, I just sort of felt lonely. Most of the other guys had already gone. The few friends that I hung around with. How did your family feel? Well, they never did say anything. They knew I had to go, and I did too, so I just, when I got the notice, I was telling you that that morning, it was snowing and sleeting and raining. It was kind of cold. I rode the old streetcar to Fort Mac, and it was, was Fort Mac where you had your basic training. 
No, that was just where I was housed until they found out where they wanted to send me. And then where did you go? We did have somewhat of a choice. So I said the Air Force because I didn't, couldn't swim that well. And I'd always been interested in airplanes anyway. So where did you go then from Fort Mac? From Fort Mac we went to Keesler Field. Um, down on the Gulf Coast near, near Biloxi, Mississippi. And do you remember arriving there? No, it was dark. I think they, a lot of times, I think they schedule your arrival in the dark. How was, how was your basic training? How was your life during that time? Well, it wasn't really a lot of fun. It, we, uh, Did you get some special training there? No, just, just the basic. The basic training. And did, do you remember much about that, about um, other people that you met during that time that were, that were there also? Or is there any memorable, memorable experiences that you have from that well, time there? We, uh, <coughs> we were housed in a new area. It was uh, near some inland water. I never did see it, but I knew it was there. And these, well, we was in the woods, and the big pine trees, and we were living in tents. And one night a big limb fell through the corner of one tent, but it happened nobody was there at the time in that particular corner. So that made us all feel good. So how, do, you, do you remember how long you were there? You were actually in, out in the wood, uh, in, living in tents the whole time of your basic training there? Mm -hmm. Is that right? Well, <clears throat> You know, I meant to go by, I came by there and was going to see if I could drive down, if they could tell me where that area was. And, and I had to go in and talk to the OD. Officer of the day, and I sort of backed out. And Ken, my son, was with me, and and uh, I don't know. I just didn't want to go in there and talk to him for some reason. And of course, we're in a hurry to get back home, but been to the. Air Force reunion at New Orleans. So, what, when you when you finished with your basic training, where did you go next? We were sent to Las Vegas, Nevada. The uh, Army Airfield. And what did you do there? Uh, that was gunnery school. How long were you out? How long was that training? Uh, wasn't very long. I really can't remember. We, you know, the 
basic training you used to refer to it in weeks and I forgot what that was and we went from uh, Fort Mac to Keesler Field and that was a uh, can't remember it was a couple of couple of three months it wasn't long really but then we went to Las Vegas and uh, all this was by train and uh, how big of a group was this that was in that I can't really remember it. it they came in there from all the uh, induction stations and uh, gunnery training was the sh shortest real training period because you, you can only learn so much about pulling the trigger. Were you able to do anything else while you were out there? Any, did, were you allowed to have fun or do anything other than just your training or was that pretty intense? We, intense. I had a my girlfriend at the time, one of the girlfriends at the time, had a brother that was stationed in in Gulfport, what was, you know, just down the Gulf Coast from Biloxi. And, uh, She tried to, she asked him to see if he could get me a pass, and nobody got passes in basic training. But she tried, and that didn't work, so nothing. How about when you were in Las Vegas? Were you able to get out at all? Once or twice. We went downtown they provided us a bus and <laughs> we went downtown and spent a little money and that's about it. So then once you were done it with your training in Las Vegas, where did you go next? Um Amarillo, Texas. There was an Army airfield there. And we took uh, aircraft mechanics. So you were trained to, to maintain the aircraft also? Mm -hmm. How was that experience there in, in Texas? Well, sort of hot and dry. We used to say that the wind would be blowing most of the time and we would say there was nothing between us and the North Pole to slow it down. But it seemed to me it was always windy at airports. Is there anything you really remember about being in Amarillo other than the wind? Well, we got some regular off days there, but 
If you've ever been to Amarillo back then, there wasn't much there. So then, then what did you do after Amarillo? Yeah, we, uh, <clears throat> there was a period there that, what they call field training, I guess. We lived in some, some more tents and amidst this sand. This, where was that? At, at Amarillo. At Amarillo. And Well, went from Amarillo we went to uh, Salt Lake City there was a I'm trying to think of these names that they called these places it was a I guess you'd call it a staging area all the trainees from pilots and navigators and whatnot and the gunners all were sent there and they assembled the crews I guess by the records of this friend we were talking about I didn't know it until I read his book that he thought he had the most intensive training and he thought he was going to be the engineer. And he was told how bitter he was for a while, but he never mentioned it, of course. But there were any of the other guys could have done each other's jobs except for one of the waste gunners. He was a, what they called an armorer. He, he mostly tended to bombs because he had to you had to disarm them before you dropped them and he was in charge of that and seeing that they were installed properly and, and uh, the pilot designated him to take care of the ball turret because he uh, he was so hanging under the plane by himself without a parachute. There was no room in there for it. And uh, he, this guy laments that situation where something happened that the people in the plane couldn't couldn't know uh, the situation you know where they couldn't handle it or something happened to the plane you know, got shot up or something he couldn't get out and uh, and that would have worried me too so, so they. Oh. Turn it off. <laughs> I'm resuming the interview with Mr. Bill Lowry. Okay, Mr. Lowry, you were talking about being in Salt Lake City and they were assembling the, the crews to go mm. overseas then. Is that correct? No, we. We they assembled the crews, but then we went to uh, combat training airfields. Oh, okay. And where was that? That was in Ardmore, Oklahoma. 
how long were you there? How long did that training take? No, three or four months. And what what was what were you doing while you were there? What were some of the the duties and all that you had while you were in Oklahoma? We um, mainly just uh, flew. Got used to flying the plane and what we could do and what we should do and what we shouldn't do. And they, uh, How big was the crew on each plane? At that time it was 10 people. And did you become a pretty close-knit group? Oh yeah. We sort of were as close, I guess, as any, or maybe closer than most. And Are there any experiences that you remember from being there? No, well, we got lost at night one time. And the Everybody was training to ground people, <laughs> just about. And we got lost at night, and some bad weather was coming up near our base. And, uh, <clears throat> and before we got on a real heading back to our base, it closed in and we couldn't go there. So we were calling for a heading to some place we could land. And they, it took us a long time to discover they were telling us the opposite of what we wanted to know. And we were headed towards, I think it was up toward Tulsa and Muskogee, and we should have been heading in the opposite direction. So we didn't carry that much fuel just on training flights, so we got a little antsy about that. And when they finally discovered what was wrong, it wasn't too bad. We, uh, uh, were directed to, uh, I think it was Tinker Field. I think it was near. Oklahoma City, and we we got there and landed, and then that field closed in. So we got to spend the night for whatever good it would do us. <laughs> we raining, and they gave us a place to sleep, and. Next morning, the pilot came over to where we were and told us that our plane had been uh, hit by a little one-engine trainer, you know, a cub type of plane back then. It was anyway. The mechanic that was working on the little plane cranked it when he had to pull the prop on it to get it started and he had the throttle set too high and it, it took off and he couldn't catch it. 
We ran into the side of our plane and he told us we'd be there a day or two. But it took him, I think it took him three days to. So we scrounged up some uniforms so we could go to town. Had a little break, a little yeah. R&R. &R. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that worked out pretty good for us. They, that was a, sort of a repair depot anyway. So they repairing the sheet metal and the structure of the plane. So they decided to look at the radios and they, they, uh, and they got several backups and they tested all of them and one wasn't but one of them working so that might have been part of our problem getting directions so they replaced all the radios <laughs> they did several things they, while I was sitting there they, I guess we better fix this one up a little bit So, so when you were done there, where did you where did you go after? See, we finally went back to Nardmore and finished our combat training, and then we <coughs> Nardmore. Who is he? One of these country western singers, I think Gene Autry, that was, I think, his hometown. So we got to look around there a little bit. Of course, it wasn't nothing to look at, mostly. Just people. And when, when you finally, when you finally went to England, then do you, do you know when they finally shipped you out? To we um, more and more we went to. Uh, in Nebraska and we were supposed to pick up a new plane and fly it over but I, I think the weather across the eastern states and the Atlantic was terrible and after waiting a little while they put us on a train to go to um, Camp Kilmer, New Jersey. You know, Joyce Kilmer. Anyway, we uh, stayed there a week or so and they put us on a on a British tanker. No, I think it was a refrigerated banana boat. And we uh, had to sleep in hammocks. And uh, of course, the food was typically British. We weren't used to what they ate, so you got to where you didn't look at it too much because you didn't want to see the 
weevils and things in it. He just ate it. So how long was the trip over to England? It's about, I think it's about 10 or 11 days. It was about half the, half the way it was pretty stormy. We went over in a convoy, of course. And of course, they put the troop ships in the middle and tried to protect us a little bit. But we got, we learned we didn't see it or hear it, but we, we were, the convoy was attacked by subs a couple of times. I think the weather helped us there too. So it was pretty uneventful except when it stopped raining, we'd go out on deck, you know, and look at the water and the other ships around. And we were, I think they called it heavy seas. You go back on the back end of the boat and you would be 30 or 40 feet below the waves looking up at them and then of course the next time you'd be on top of them. And that was pretty scary. But other than being sick a few times, that's about all you could expect. So once you got to England, um, was, did you start um, doing missions from No, from we went, uh, we landed at Liverpool. I think that was at night too, but I don't think that was planned. But uh, the they shipped, you know, a few crews one place and a few another, and they were mainly in in the yards of former mansions, I guess they still were, but the, the military had taken them over, you know, for headquarters and they built little outhouses, I call them, for the crews to stay in, you know one or two to a little house and that's what that's when they uh, I can't think of that word that I was wanted to use they, uh, Anyway, they told us about the weather in England and how to dress and what to expect. And after that, we were, we were, that's when we were sent to our final. Airfield. Do you remember your first combat mission? Oh, um, sort of. Um, we were ready to fly just before D Day, and I 
I can't remember now why our crews left out of some of those what we call easy missions. Now we could have we could have picked up five or ten missions short and probably been on our way home <laughs> in just a couple of months. But we were left out. Well, we flew, but when you fly spare, you don't get credit for it. Because you're up there and you and you are about to get in the formation, and that's that's a mission in itself because you have to fly no matter what the weather is if they if the mission is still on well, you go up and you fly around in the dark for a while and if there's cloud cover you fly through it amongst all the hundreds of other planes that are doing the same thing. So you wonder who's on each side, who's above you, or who's under you. And uh, you fly spare, you go up and you tag along with the formation. If nobody drops out, you have to go back to the base. And the other guys keep flying to the easy missions. Now, of course, the hard missions, we call them the most dangerous. There was always somebody that dropped out. So, how about your first hard mission that you went on? That was just southwest of Paris. And that was considered an easy mission. You saw a little flak and and you got we got to see Paris. It, Unless we saw the outline of it from about 50 miles away or so. But and what was the mission? It was just a general uh, railroads and bridges. Did you have any problems or you? Shot no, at her. no, we. They always told you to, at the beginning, you know, to count the flak bursts and they'd take your mind off of what it really was and what it could really do to you. Did you feel scared while you were on these missions? Yeah. You okay. He was scared. When you saw it after that, you were scared when you saw where it was in the briefing. When you wait for them to move the curtain and show the map, you know, and you see these ribbons going way into France and Germany, and you could tell about how scared you were going to be. <laughs> and you, your plane was shot down in Germany? Yes. Could you tell me about that experience? About that mission? Yeah, we, um, uh, 
who went through other halls and preliminaries and we were headed for Nuremberg. And uh, we were supposed to hit a tank factory and I think it was in the middle of the town. And some say we hit it, some say we didn't. So just as we dropped the bombs, that was also a very tense few minutes because you, you went up, went in a certain direction and you, you'd make a couple of turns before you supposedly gave up your secrecy about where it was going to be and of course they knew just about as much about it as we did. You know, because they had plenty of time to figure out what, it, what city you might be going to after you got about halfway into the mission. You know, they could figure out like, like these weathermen do where the tornadoes are going to hit in a certain area. And, uh, the last, the last 30 minutes or so is really the giveaway and you'd have to turn on what they call the initial point and uh, <clears throat> in about halfway there's about 30 minutes before the target and about halfway you'd Turn on the final approach heading, and uh, then you'd have to fly straight and level and you know, at a certain speed. Of course, they knew all that. <laughs> just as well as we did, just about. And uh, the main thing they didn't know probably was the altitude we would be over the target at, because they didn't, they didn't shoot at each plane from the any aircraft batteries. They had a certain, once they figured your altitude, all they had to do was keep firing at a certain position in the sky and, and we would have to fly through it. We could tell where the target was. So it, it worked out somewhat for us too by that bunch of flak, you know, it'd be in the same area. And of course, the formation before you, you could see them going through it and when it come your turn when you went through it. No turning back. So, We went through it, and just as we got, just as we dropped the bombs, 
you'd either make a sharp right turn or a left turn to get out of that flat. So we had made a right turn and about that time we got hit. Just as we started to turn. Then what happened? And then I well, that's when I really got scared. Was when I got hit. The same same shell that Now I see it. <clears throat> it uh, seemed to be a, almost a direct hit in number three engine and from left to right, you know, looking forward, there's one, two, and three, four. So it, I see it hit number three. And Bob said it was number two. But anyway, two, three, and four were out. All we had was the one, number one outboard engine, you know, trying to keep it. Pilot said he had a hard time keeping it from flipping over because all the power we had was on that left outboard engine. If it had been one of the inboards that were still running, we would have had a little bit better control. But the other planes into formation, oh, reported that we were we were dropping out of the formation, you know, pretty rapidly, I guess. And they reported that all our engines were still turning, but they weren't. But number three. I suspect we're almost blown out of the plane. Now, number number two was running away. They, that's when the, it's running and you can't control it. And of course, it's they generally speed up and either throw a propeller or catch on fire or something. And were you injured at that point? Yeah. That piece of shell looks like it came through the engine and uh, cause it looks like it hit something steel. Did you hold it up? Hmm? Did you hold it up? Say this went well. And where did, where did that? See, this part looks like it came through something that was steel. And the engine generally was the only part of the plane that had much steel to it. And uh, these shells are made to break up in smaller pieces. Now, it's seen some that were some slabs of the shell, you know, about that long that they took out of some planes. And you can see where this one almost broke in two or three places. But that's sort of unusual for it to be that big. And of course, it's bigger than my, almost in my arm. And it, it hit right under the point of my elbow. And it broke all three bones and lodged up in this part of my arm. 
And at that point, were you able to do anything? Well, I, I kept from crying. But I, uh, you know, I reported that I was hit, and uh, of course everybody knew that the whole plane was in trouble by that point. So I, I just turned my turret around, and then Bob was saying he was on the way up there. To check on it, and he, uh, when he got up there, I was out of the turret, you know, and had had my parachute handy, and I didn't hear what was going on on the intercom after the first couple of minutes. And uh, he came up, and uh, I don't think anybody else was hurt. Now one or two hurt their feet and legs when they landed in the parachute. So was everybody able to get out? Yeah, I worried a long time about how the pilot got out. Because he was the one keeping it in the air. And evidently the automatic pilot worked enough so he could lock it down and crawl out. Of course, he, he sat on his parachute, you know, the pilot and co-pilot, so he didn't have to worry about getting that on. So did your friend help you get your parachute on? Yes. To get you well, out of the plane? Yeah, he put it on and uh, had figured it out and put it on backwards so I could pull it this way. A little <laughs> I can't remember all these simple names that, you know, he had a little handle to pull. Ripcord. Ripcord. Thanks. And... So then what happened once you were on the ground? Well, before I got out of the plane, though, know, everybody was... Slapping me on the head, and then I got to worrying about Bob. He had come up with a little walk-around oxygen bottle that wasn't filled properly. The ground crew had missed it in their checking, and he'd come up there, and he was. All wild eyed, and you know, his eyes were sort of a blank stare because he was running out of oxygen. And I got him on a reserve oxygen connection. And then he did his little thing, and and, uh, and then I showed him where the power walk around bottle was located. And I wondered if it had anything in it to get him back to the where he was going to bail out. See, I never saw any of them again until we, several years after we got home. And uh, 
I didn't see anybody over there that I'd ever seen before. Get, you get to thinking about it, and it, it really works on your nerves. So he pushed you out of the plane? Is that? No, he was directing me toward the little passageway between the pilots, the little hole there that you had to go down to the where the navigator and bombardier were, and that's where the escape hatch was. So while I was getting down in there, wasn't a lot of room, and uh, people were hitting me on the head. I don't know where they were saying goodbye or, or whether they were <laughs> rushing me to probably they both are saying so long and whatever. And uh, they had already pulled the, the safety catch on the door, you know. You pull them and the doors fly off. And, I don't remember seeing the navigator and volunteer, but they all waited till I got out. And then the rest of them started leaving. And uh, something happened right in there. I, I can't recall now what it was. But fortunately, we all got out. I learned after we got back home. I didn't know what had happened, whether they all got out or not. So then you were captured? Yeah. Oh, the home guard had a little truck and they, one little road and I saw this truck coming out and I said, well, there's my ride. <laughs> so I landed in this uh, sugar beet field. They get all, the, they used to get all their <clears throat> sugar from beets, you know, they have any places where they could have cane fields. They had lots of fields, but they didn't grow it. They used a sugar beet. Thank goodness it was there because it was kind of soft dirt. And fortunately, I was able to steer myself just enough to keep them hitting on this side. So I just sat there till they got out. <laughs> Told me the war was over for me. You know that old saying. That, of course they said it in German, but for you the war is over. So you were, were you, you were in a POW camp? They, did they eventually take you to a POW camp? I rode in a little, they switched me to a little Ford car and drove me to, to uh, to a little town. I can't think of the name of that town. It was. How were the conditions there? 
Well, this place was just uh, just for a night or two. And I never, I don't remember any of the people that were there. They were, it was late in the afternoon when I got there and they were feeding me some stale cake and stuff like that. People that sent them. But I, they were foreign, I couldn't understand. How long were you actually there then, in Germany? Uh, nearly six months. Six months. Was it, were the, how were the conditions generally? In, I was at a hospital, so. You were in a hospital. That worked out mm -hmm. real well. And then, did you, um, then you came home after that? Were you discharged? It? Yeah. They, when the time came, we came home on an exchange ship, a Swedish exchange ship grips on and they took us to a little town outside of Munich called Freising and we stayed in a, kind of a hotel looking building that two or three about three stories high and the whole center of it was It was empty, it was what, an atrium without a top on it or something. Anyway, it was, the building was in a square shape. Had a time keeping warm there because it, they just had one little fireplace in, in a pretty large room. And this was after the war was over at that point? When no. Mm -hmm. How did... We were... Uh, at that time, we were on our way home. So we had to stop at this building in Rising, and then they... Then they went by train to uh, Switzerland and got some ice cream. And then you were on your way home? Mm -hmm. And how did it feel to get home? <laughs> Do you remember arriving back? Yeah, the rest of the guys were hazing me because they carried me off the ship and I could have walked but they wouldn't let me. So they'd see me, see them carrying me and they'd all hollering and carrying on. So it was good to be back? Yeah. Okay. We landed it. Well, we went, were sent to Halloran General Hospital and stayed there a few days and they gave us all new uniforms and I was, came out, I was in a British Army uniform. Still had my flying boots on. At that time, they weren't, they were thin rubber with a heating wire through them to keep you warm. And so I came home as a, more or less a British army guy. Thank you. Sorry, we didn't get to <laughs> as much as there's, there's so I much know, more. I know. I know it. Oh, I'm, I'm wondering. I'm going to stop this because the next one is here. Yeah.